All right, well, welcome to the last class. My intrepid few here. I think it's about 15 people out of 50. Uh, it's nice, nice day out. So hello, hello to all of you out there in Zoom land. Um, so quick, couple of quick comments. Um, next time, uh, sorry, not next time. There is no next time, we're done. Um, you've got the final, final exam. Uh, opens up, what did I say, the 10th to the 11th or the 11th to the 12th? I don't remember. Tuesday to Wednesday. So you've got to Tuesday afternoon into Wednesday night, just like we normally do. It only covers chapters 13 and 14, so it's two-thirds as long as it normally is. So it's not anything special. It's not a comprehensive exam. It's just those last two chapters, the last two. So we'll finish up today. Um, you also have due uh, in a couple of days your letter to a um to a uh, politician um uh so i had a couple of questions about that i said you know one to two pages because i don't want to make it too arduous if you want to write longer than that that's okay i will tell you and i've this comment i gave back to to somebody who asked like can i write you know my letter's already like four pages long um I'm like that's fine i'm not going to take any points if you want to write something longer you know feel free um uh, I will tell you, and but I will tell you, if you are trying to address an actual leader of some sort, right, a politician or whatever, and you're trying to make a point, they're not going to read a four or five page long message from a constituent, right? So if you write a letter to Maggie Hassan or to Governor Sununu, and it's not concise, a couple hundred words at most, it'll, you know, it'll just get thrown in the trash can. It just won't, it won't have an impact. Um, for the purposes of the assignment though, you can go longer. I didn't want to, I wasn't going to assign you a longer thing, but if you want, if you're really passionate about what you're writing about, I'm all, I'll read it. I will, I will read it. Governor Sununu probably would, but I will. Um, so no, no, no harm, no foul. If you want to write longer than what the assignment said. Uh, one thing that I, uh, one or two people have asked uh, me to look at a draft and, and I've glanced at them. I'm not going to give you a like formal critique of a draft, uh, but I will glance at it to see if it seems to be making the appropriate, uh, meeting the criteria. And one of the criteria that folks seem to be forgetting about is you have to have three references. What that means is you have to have three different um, resources that you are drawing on for the, um, for the paper. Uh, you can reference the set, you can cite the same reference more than once, um, but you need to have at least three. So I was like, you know, according to the New York Times, blah, 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 or, you know, according to the Wall Street Journal, we had this, that, um, those would be, so that's, that's one thing that I did see that folks, so you don't want to lose 10 points just because you did, forgot to cite three things. Okay. All right, good. So I'm going to jump back for a second to um, chapter 13 because some major, major policy issues are happening in the United States right now. Um, I just want to remind you about something we talked about. So what got leaked this week um, uh, and it's been making rounds in the news? Ma'am. And what does Roe v. Wade and Casey, which is actually probably the more important one, guarantee? Okay. I'm, I'm not sure about the contraception person. I haven't read the, the draft. I, what I've heard about the draft is it doesn't address contraception, but it does address abortion. Um, so Roe v. Wade was the original case that legalized, that said women had a, uh, had a constitutional right to, an, to, to seek an abortion if they so desired. And it was couched in what cultural 
assumption. So what is it that underlies this idea that women should have a right to, um, to seek an abortion? I may be too vague here. Um, what is the legal concept? Like, what is it? It's not, it's not that they said abortion per se is, is what they're addressing, right? It was what? Bodily autonomy? Yeah, okay, so essentially, yes. Um, it, it's privacy, right? The idea is, is that, and bodily autonomy would be kind of part of, of kind of part of privacy. So, so the idea was, this is a private matter, right? First and foremost is a private matter. Bodily autonomy, this is a woman's, you know, it's a woman's body, they have the right to choose how, whether they want to uh, be able to have an abortion or not. Um, so, uh, so Roe v. Wade, and then later on another case called Casey, I forget um, uh, uh, the, the full description, kind of solidified Roe v. Wade. Um, and so now there's a Texas bill, I believe it's the Texas bill has gone all the way to Supreme Court. Um, and, and has challenged the, the existing legal decisions of Roe v. Wade and Casey. Um, and so what we had with Roe v. Wade, I mean, you, you talk about abortion, everybody knows Roe, right? Like every, you've probably heard Roe v. Wade for most of your life around this topic, right? Whether you're, whether you're pro-choice or pro-life, you've heard Roe uh, over and over again. So this is an example of judge-made law, which we talked about last time, right? So this is the judges in the Roe case said, we have, um, we're looking at the constitution and we're looking at cultural assumptions built into the constitution. Cause there isn't, something ex there isn't something explicit in the constitution that says, and oh, by the way, you know, uh, women have a right to uh, the uh, privacy and the choice of whether they want to, uh, uh, complete a pregnancy or terminate it. Like that's not in the constitution. And so they said, okay, what, how do we, how do we address this very critical question? Um, and the way they came at it was to say, well, we have a cultural and legal belief that, um, that we have right to bodily autonomy, right to, um, and in particular through a right to privacy, right? Private actions and that, that, Pregnancy is a private action, not within the sphere of the state. That was kind of the argument. Um, and there's been a lot of argument kind of back and forth uh, about how good that decision was, right? So I think critics of the decision say, that's not the, of Roe, say, and Roe and Casey say, you really kind of created a right that didn't, didn't really exist, that we don't have a, we don't have a legal precedent for it. And we don't, and we don't have a a unified cultural belief about that. So so, um, so there's been a lot of of kind of Roe has always been in from my reading, and I'm not a I'm not a legal scholar, but from my reading and my understanding, has always been somewhat fragile. Um, but it's been sustained, right? So. So, so, but I wanted to highlight this because Roe essentially was a, was a, was judge made law, right? So, so that particular court essentially created a law that said states can't make abortion illegal. Um, I happen to be pro-choice, uh, but uh, because, you know, like I told you from day one, I'm a very much, I'm a, I'm a libertarian and I believe in, very high, I have very high standards of, of individual privacy. Um, and, and so I think the government has to, ha, has to really stretch to uh, impose um, restrictions on individual freedom. But that said, I do also think that it seems like this was a judge made law that, and we've had, we have a large proportion of our society doesn't think abortion should be a, a large minority thinks abortion should be illegal, period. And then there's a lot of debate about how far into, you know, uh, how far into pregnancy should you be able to go to terminate a pregnancy and under what conditions and so on and so forth. Um, 
So, I mean, I think, I would hope, none of you would think that it's okay to terminate a pregnancy at eight months and 29 days. Like that would be, you know, that's tantamount to murder, right? Um, but at the same time, if you're pro-choice, I mean, if, if you're pro-choice, right, you probably say, okay, well, maybe not then, right? So we've used a lot for a long time. The courts then kind of came back with a viability standard that said, okay, you can use, so usually most, you can't have a, you can have an abortion up to the point where the, where the fetus is viable outside of the womb, right? So you can, um, so there's some point there where, um, where it, it is, it is, it ceases to be the woman's choice. Um, and so we've had a lot of court decisions over the years since Roe kind of defining where we cut that, where we say, okay, you know, you've carried it, you've carried the, the, the fetus this long, you can no longer choose to terminate your pregnancy. Um, and, you know, uh, and so this is a lot of this has been judge made law and then different states have submitted legislation, right, that contradicts the law. And so we have, again, competitive federalism, right, where we say, well, there are certain things that the federal government can say, and there are certain things that the states can say and can regulate. So what it looks like, and so when we had Roe from the Supreme Court, that was a federal law that said this applies across, you know, across the United States. Um, and then, and then states started to challenge it and, and kind of get to cl and clarify where the line is that where can you legally terminate a pregnancy. Um, and that varies from state to state to some degree based on a lot of, you know, again, we're a common law, we're a common law society. So it's a blend of legislation and judge made law. So I think one of the problems with Roe and our, our current abortion um, regime in the United States is that it was in fact judge made law, right? That's always been a problem because it wasn't something, I think it's always been a problem because it wasn't something that that um, we'd voted on, right, as a society. This is an important issue. It's a really important issue on both sides. It's a really important issue. Um, and we, and it had been kind of default created, right? Which is, a, so it's a good example of judge made law. And so I think it has always been challenged because uh, of its nature as judge made law. So it's an interesting question. Um, so what will happen if this passes? Well, what will happen is there will be no longer be a national law, right? There will no longer be a national standard. If this passes, they strike down Roe, they strike down Casey, there will no longer be a national, uh, a, constitu a, a, a constitutional right, at which point it devolves back to the states. And so we'll have state competition, right? Going back to, so, so think about the Justin McKinney video I, I showed you. While that one was a silly one, this is a very, very serious one, right? While he was joking about fireworks and being able to buy booze and all that, this is a very serious one where, and, and you can already see the states lining up to offer competitive um, legal structures where you're gonna have a lot of the South and the Midwest states saying, it's illegal to have an abortion, period, right? Or it's gonna be highly constrained. And then you're gonna have, then you have a lot of the blue states lining up to say, you know, no, it's, it's still legal. And so that gets into the whole idea of competitive federalism again. So, so regardless of how you feel about the particular situation, um, I want you to see how what we've talked about applies, right? That you're now going to have different states with different, will be able to come up with different solutions to this. Um, I suspect we will see years and years of court cases fighting, fighting it out. Like it's not, if this gets struck down, that's not the end of the story. Now we're gonna see a bunch of legislation passed in various states, and then you're gonna see a whole bunch of, bunch more um, uh, uh, of court cases, again, trying to refine exactly what's allowed and what's not allowed. Um, but what you will see is competition between the states, right? With different policy regimes 
that represent the cultural interests of the states. And there'll be a lot of variation. And so if you want to live in a place where women have the right to choose, you will have to probably move from Alabama to you know, New York, right? Um, and so I think you will see people and businesses um, voicing their opinions and then, and then choosing to exit, right? We talked about voice and exit. So you're gonna see a lot of voice. You're gonna see a lot of people really angry about, you know, uh, angry and celebrating. Um, my, my parents are both very pro-life uh, people. Um, so we've had, a well, once upon a time, we had a lot of heated discussions about this. I, we don't argue about it anymore. We just agree to disagree. Um, but uh, <clears throat> but um, we're going to see a lot of, of voice, right? A lot of people trying to get the law changed. And then we're going to see probably a fair amount of exit in the sense of, I don't wanna live in a state that believes this and they're gonna move. And so states will have to, have, leadership in the states will have to make a decision um, about, you know, is this something that's important enough, important enough to grant the right or is it something that's important enough that we're not going to grant the right and do we wanna, what policy regime do we wanna have in this state? So as this rolls along, Right, and it, and it won't be, I think the final, uh, I think they expect the final decision to actually come out sometime in June. So as this rolls along, I want you to think about the lens that we've talked about in terms of judge-made law versus legislation, right? And how policy gets made. And then, right, exit and voice, right? Will people start leaving states where they don't agree with the policy? Um, and then, you know, the levels of decision making. So right now, the Supreme Court is at federal level, right? And it has some rights to impose um, some of those rights. So the federal government through the, Const the United States Constitution has the right to impose certain things universally. And one of the things the judges are now saying is a right to an abortion is no longer a thing that the federal government has a right to impose universally. And so that will now devolve to the states. And that's the nature of our legal system. So major health, health issue, and this is, so the framework, I, and I'm, try, I'm not trying to say yes or no, like if you are pro-choice, you know, that's fine. If you are pro-life, pro that's fine. I'm just trying to tell you that, uh, the len I wanna remind you that we have this useful lens to think about, um, about what's going to happen, what does that mean, right? So let's finish up chapter 14. Um, one of the points I wanted to jump back to for a second All right, this is not cooperating. I want to jump back for a second to um, the slide I showed you. I'm having a little bit of technical difficulty here. Uh, so I wanted to jump back for a second because it occurred to me I didn't really express. I talked about this problem of demographics from a financing perspective where we have our social spending, things like Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security are, are premised on having a wider base and a narrower top to our demographics where we have a lot of workers contributing in. I talked about that. That's a really important point you should take away for understanding social spending of this nature. The other thing that is implied here is, is about needs for 
population. We're going to have probably, you know, right now we have something close to what as many 60, you know, 60 year olds as we do to zero to four year olds. What does that imply going forward about healthcare needs in the United States? What are we going to need a lot more of in the, you know, as as this as these this bulge keeps working its way to the top? Absolutely, right? We're gonna need a lot more long-term care, right? And what we when we talked about long-term care, where is most long-term and how is most long-term care delivered? Okay, so we have a lot in the formal sector, absolutely, right? We have, we have nursing homes. We're gonna need a lot more of them because those are for the nursing homes, ideally are for the sickest people, right? Most long-term care actually happens in the home, right? And happens with informal care, which means younger generations take care of older generations. So most care is, most long-term care is someday your mom and dad are gonna be old and they're not going to want to go to a nursing home if they can help it. Um, and so they're going to, you know, and you're probably not going to want to put them in a nursing home if you can help it, if you can afford it. And so his, most long-term care, and most people don't need that level of care, right? What they need is some support, some care, um, some attention, but they don't need to be institutionalized. Um, most people don't. And so most long-term care is informal and in the home, and it's usually children taking care of parents. So my dad um, uh, is now 74, still very healthy, but you know, I know sometime probably in the next 10 to 12 years, you know, knock on wood that he makes it that long, he's probably gonna start needing more help from me in terms of maybe going, you know, event, probably start by, he might need some homemaking help, like, you know, maybe taking care of his yard. He might need me to help him, you know, go food shopping and he's married. So uh, his wife is a year, two, two, two or three years younger than him, but they're both, you know, getting up there. Uh, they're both over 70. Uh, they're both slowing down. Hopefully he's not listening to this recording, um, you know, and they are I'm pretty sure he's not. So, but at some point, you know, he doesn't want to go to a nursing home. We've talked about that. Like he doesn't want to go to a nursing home. Um, and so, you know, between my sister and I, and my and since my sister lives in Philadelphia and my dad lives on Dover Point, going to be, you know, yours truly doing that most likely. Um, uh, this implies, right, for me, sometime in the future, I'm going to probably be doing some uh, care. And my wife's family is 10 years. My wife's mom and dad uh, are actually 10 years older than that. They're both in their 80s. And they're both still doing great. They both still drive. There's both, you know, and so they don't need anything just yet. But chances are, you know, and we've been very lucky um, so far on both sides of our family that they are reasonably healthy. You know, nobody's been hit with dementia, you know, but sooner or later, you know, it comes for all of us, right? And so, so historically, historically, and it is still true today, most people um, uh, wind up providing some long-term care at some point for their elders. So that's what's implied here is two things. One, we're going to need, we're going to have a lot more need for, um, for long-term care facility. We're going to have a lot more need for long-term care period. That means that we're going to have a lot more need for, you know, you all will probably wind up taking care of your parents or your, and or your grandparents, if you're still lucky enough to have them, right? Um, uh, and there's fewer of you young folks, because you're down here in the 20 to most of you are probably in the, you're either in the 19 to 20, you know, I, I know you're not 15. Um, you're probably in that, you know, fourth or fifth rung up here, right? which means you're smaller than all the folks above you. 
um, in terms of, uh, so you are going to wind up delivering some, it is likely you will wind up delivering some care and the proportion of people to provide that care is shrinking relative to the larger um, number. And that's, like I said, even worse, right, in Europe. So they're even worse off in Europe. All right, so let me jump back forward here. So we were talking about GDP to, to debt ratio last time. And I said, you know, over here on the far left, back in the 70s, we were doing 35, 30-ish percent. And then through the 80s, we started ramping up. Um, and then uh, come 2008, uh, the federal government started spending like a drunken sailor. Um, and so, you know, and then, and then uh, between the Trump administration and then the Biden administration, they just couldn't get their hands out of the cookie jar. And we have so much, we have, we have spent so much money at this point, um, borrowed so much money at this point that the ratio is now well above, um, well above 100% in terms of our obligations. Um, and that is the, when the government spends too much money, prints too, creates too much money, that triggers inflation. Now we've been through a period of time, most of your life, all of your lifetimes. I mean, unless, yeah, none of your, yes, ma'am. That is, right? So that's, that's, that is a big jump for COVID. Um, yep. Yep. I mean, we've spent something like $6 trillion over the last two years uh, on various COVID relief programs. And that big spike is what's causing, you know, 10% inflation right now. Um, you know, it's the reason why your food is suddenly jumping in cost. It's the re it's, it's, I would say it's likely that you're going to see an increase in tuition for those of you that are, you know, going to be here a few more years. I, I, I can't see any way that we can't have an increase in tuition um, coming up and probably a non-trivial one. Um, you know, uh, all the faculty are, you know, I haven't, got, I'm not getting, as far as I know, I'm not getting a raise, you know, of any sort to, to match the fact that my income now buys 10% less than it did two years, you know, a, a year and a half ago. Um, so, you know, we have a union, the union is in negotiations right now with the administration for our contract. Um, and so I guarantee you, one of the discussions is, hey, we've got 10% inflation, you're going to need to give us a you know, you're going to need to give us a 10% raise just to get us, keep us back, get, bring us back to where we were before the inflation hit. That's a pretty typical argument. And you're going to see that across, um, across the country. Uh, uh, everybody, including you guys who you know, work part-time, if you're still getting paid what you were paid, um, you know, a year and a half ago, you know, if you're making 10 bucks an hour or 12 bucks an hour, whatever it is you do at your job, <clears throat> you're effectively making... 10, 15% less than you did a year and a half ago, if you're still being paid the same amount as you were a year and a half ago, right? That's the nature of inflation. Those are roads what you can buy. Um, part of the problem with this from a healthcare perspective, so from a healthcare perspective, what does that mean? Well, that means the, the doctors and nurses want more money. Um, you know, everybody that works, everybody that works anywhere is going to be like, hey, my pay doesn't go as far as it used to. And so everybody's going to ask for more money. That's going to drive up the cost of goods, of goods and services. Healthcare is just one more of them, right? So we can you guarantee you we're going to be seeing, and I know, um, you know, I, I know there's an enormous strain and, um, in the, uh, uh, in the healthcare industry for, uh, for, for wages right now. any way to reverse the effects. So, so the only way, so this is not, so bear in mind, this is not inflation. This is the debt relative to, right? So, um, uh, so this is not inflation. I, this is not a graph of inflation. I'm just talking generally about inflation. So the way that we stop inflation, so we bring the rate down from 10 back down to two, is we, we uh, have to remove money from the economy. And the way we do that is we raise interest rates. So if you are borrowing money to pay student loans, um, any new loans you take out will be at a higher rate than 
uh, what you, you previously borrowed at. The only way to slow inflation is to raise interest rates. So the last time we had inflation like this was in the 70s um, when I was a kid. And it was the direct result of um, uh, Johnson's Great Society. I don't know if you guys have studied that in your history classes. But Johnson, you know, in the 60s, uh, so in the 60s, we saw, as we all talked about, Medicare, Medicaid, big government expenditures. Um, the war on poverty, Johnson's war on poverty brought about welfare and a bunch of other payments that the federal government started making. And oh, by the way, we were, we were in the Vietnam War. So we were borrowing money to, to pay for the Vietnam War. And we were borrowing money to pay for all these new entitlements that, that the Johnson administration and the Democratic Party wanted to bring about. All of that combined together to create a spike, not on, well, if you can't see it here. Well, first of all, because it happened before this chart begins. It won't be, a, if I, even if I did that, it won't be as dramatic because of the size of where we're at now. But if we did a, just like scoped in a similar chart to this for like the, from the say 50s through to 1970-ish, you would see a big spike in the 70s that's similar to what we're seeing here. Um, with all that spending happening, very much like the way we've been spending on COVID over the last two years, um, generated an inflation that um, really devastated the economy for a long time. Um, and it got progressively worse to double digits, like 13, 15% in the late 70s, so when I was, so I was born in 1970. So I always tell this, when I talk about inflation to my finance class, I always tell a story of, I remember like back in 1979, um, I was nine years old, eight, nine years old, and I was living in uh, Newton at the time. And uh, and I would get, you know, nine years old, I'd get on my Huffy bike, you know, like you guys watch uh, Stranger Things? Like my, that's my childhood, less the monsters. That's my childhood. Like all the images, all the music, all the, the Dungeons and Dragons, that was me. Uh, all about that nerdy little kid. Anyway, so I'm, you know, so at the beginning, I, so in the beginning of summer, it's probably the summer of 79, um, ride my, you know, ride my little huffy bike down to, with the big handlebars, you know, um, around down the corner to this place called uh, uh, Johnny's, which technically was the Pine Street Market. Um, and I'd go down there with my, with my uh, um, paper route money. And I would, you know, for 50 cents, I could buy a um, can of, you know, can of Coke and a candy bar, right? 25 cents each, believe it or not, that once upon a time, you could um, buy a can of Coke and a, and a, and a candy bar for 50 cents. Um, and uh, at a convenience store. And so then I'd, you know, then I'd go off with my buddies and we'd be, you know, riding our huffies around. So by the end of the summer, I remember going in and paying um, 50 cents for a can of Coke and 50 cents for a, um, uh, for a candy bar, which, you know, you're a kid, whatever. But suddenly I was half as wealthy. By the end of the summer, I was half as wealthy I had been at the beginning of summer. That's inflation, right? Now, some these things move in uneven that's 100% inflation in case you you know not doing the math in your head right so inflation moves in different parts of the economy at different rates so different things go up at different rates um, and they sometimes um, are the result of structural uh, excuse me supply problems uh, and sometimes they are just general um, movements of price level General movements of what I, what I mean by price level is everything kind of gets more expensive versus particular items getting more expensive. So right now, if you're trying to buy a car, you've probably seen the prices dramatically jump, um, you know, 20, 30%. And the reason for that is um, the components that go into a car, like computer chips come from, mostly come from Taiwan um, and, COVID has impacted that fairly directly. And so the result of that is there's a specific shortage of, of computer chips. Um, and so anything that you, in particular cars are just loaded with computer chips. The car that you're, you, know, you buy today is basically a computer on four wheels. The car that I bought when I was you know, your age was a junky old machine, right? But you know, today's you know, between the, the, the cameras and you know, the, all the amazing technology that tells you if you're drifting over the line, anything like that. Um, 
So sometimes you have very specific um, shortages that generate inflation on particular things. Otherwise, but when the government spends too much money and pushes too much money into the economy, that causes an overall increase in the price level. Um, and so you'll see it, typically it hits food and energy first, and then it hits other parts. So it's kind of uneven. So chances are we're never gonna see, kind of to go with Jack's question, we're never gonna see like, like never gonna see a candy bar for 25 cents again, right? Like that's never, you know. and so, you know, whatever the inflation is we're seeing now, many of those things will never go back down again. Um, but what we can do is, is slow the rate of increase. And the only way to do that is to raise interest rates. So one of the things I think I mentioned you guys, maybe I'm, I'm in the process of buying a, a, a rental property. And last summer I refinanced my house and I was able to get a, a mortgage at 2.3%, which is unreal. It's practically free money. Um, and I just signed a, uh, I just signed a mortgage uh, on this other property and I'm paying higher rate because it's a rental property. But that aside, I'm paying 5.75% for the, the new loan that I'm getting a year later, right? So if it was a, if it was a personal, like if, I was, if it was gonna be my home, it'd probably be closer to 5%. So interest rates on long loans have more than doubled in the last year. And that's because of inflation. And eventually the Fed is going to, the Federal Reserve, which is the banker for the United States, is going to raise interest rates. Uh, they have been raising interest rates and they're going to raise them even more. And one of, the, one of the effects was, so going back to my little story about 1979, 1980, interest rates on, um, on long loans, like buying a house, if you wanted to get like a 30 year loan, when, so I, I just got a loan last summer for 2.3%. 2, 2, 2 it's like 2.325, something like that. Um, if you were trying to buy a house in 1980 and you wanted a 30 year loan, the rate would have been something like 18%, which is, in, which is insane, right? And so most people weren't doing, you know, so that, so, and then the Fed raised the short term rates. So if you wanted to buy a car or you wanted to buy something shorter term, you know, for a year, the year rates were closer to 13%. So, so what was wild about that was you could take your money to the bank and put it in a CD and you could get 13% interest on your CD, right? Um, but the problem was that, that with inflation going at 13 or 14%, you were basically just breaking even. Um, it felt like you were getting richer because you suddenly had a whole lot of money, but the money couldn't buy as much stuff. So it basically, you were just kind of breaking even. So everybody was pretty bad shape in the 70s. And I'm afraid that, we're likely to see something like that in the near future, probably not double digit interest rates, but we're gonna see pretty high and in, higher interest rates than you have seen in your lifetime. If you go to try to buy a car, instead of getting, you know, one and a half percent when you graduate, you'll probably get more like seven or 8% interest on your, you know, you'll have to buy a car at seven or 8% interest, at least for the next few years till we get this under control. So what does that mean for inflation, uh, for health, right? Everything's more expensive. Um, and that means, you know, that means um, the care you buy is more expensive. If the care you buy is more expensive, your insurance is going to be more expensive. It's going to eat more into your salary. So you're going to have to get a higher paying job. And it's all a bad thing that typically leads to a recession. So I'm, if you're a junior, senior, is a high likelihood you will be graduating into a recession, um, which means jobs will go away. Uh, there'll be a lot less economic opportunity. The good news is it always bounces back, but it's not good to graduate into one. I graduated from college in 1992. Um, 1992, we had a recession started in the, in the in 91, and most of my friends, you know, graduating, uh, couldn't find, you know, wound up having to work retail and crappy jobs for couple of years because the economy was in bad shape. Um, good news is, you know, they all survived, um, but it was lean years. Uh, all right, so the federal government, 
This is the 2020 uh, budget. I wasn't able to find a cute layout for the 2021 budget, but 2020, um, we spent $6.6 .6 trillion. Um, that's not normal. Normal, it, it, at least 20, the 2019 budget, I wanna say was somewhere like four. So we saw a huge increase and that huge increase was largely, um, uh, 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 was a large portion of that was stimulus, right? Um, but if you look at the breakdown, I want you to look at how much of are we spending uh, on um, Medicare and Medicaid, $1.2 trillion. Um, if you add in social security, another 1.1 trillion. So that's $2.3 trillion on insurance, essentially, right? Social security uh, and, and so social spending. So we're spending somewhere in the tune of $2.3 trillion. Most of that is going to the, to the, to the elderly in our population. So people over 65 are, are getting that money. That money is a transfer from you as a worker to the elderly population, setting aside Medicaid. Medicaid includes some elderly and some, some um, uh, people in, the, uh, in prime years. But uh, the bulk of that money, uh, including Medicaid, is going as a transfer from working age people to the elderly. So when we were looking at that, at that populate those demographics and looking at, we've got a narrower bottom than a, than a fat middle and then a you know, narrowing top. The problem here is we've got, we're gonna have as those, as that fat middle moves up into retirement age, as we live longer and retire longer, we need these benefits are gonna keep getting bigger. And so that means the burden is gonna fall on you all to pay those benefits. One of the things that I remember looking at you know, 10, 12 years ago, not even, was that if you added up Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, they were roughly equal to defense. So now Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security added together are, would we say, um, 2.3 trillion versus defense 700 billion. So we're talking about whereas they once all the social spending was roughly equal to what we spent on defense, now it's three, more than three times as much. Um, then you have the way that, um, the way that politicians talk a lot is, is they'll talk about mandatory spending and discretionary spending. So mandatory spending means there's a law in place that says the federal government has to spend money in, on a particular thing. So that would include Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. Those are not discretionary. There's a law that says the federal government has to do those things, right? Um, things that are discretionary include defense um, and then stuff like, and then everything else like the State Department, like all our embassies around the world, um, uh, the Department of Education, the Department of Transportation, right? Roads and, you know, your federal roads, like federal highways, all the money that goes to that. Um, uh, national parks, you know, all that kind of stuff fits into the non-defense discretionary. So roughly, right, it's roughly the defense wedge plus the non-defense wedge represents discretionary. Everything else, there's a law that says we have to spend on that. So the only way to, the only way to spend less is to pass a new law that says we don't have to do that anymore. And no politician or very few politicians, Paul Ryan, you know, um, was a uh, Republican, ran for vice president with, uh, he was a speaker of the house and ran for vice president with uh, uh, Mitt Romney uh, against Obama uh, back in, what was that, 08? Um, uh, uh, Paul Ryan actually called for cuts to social security and Medicare um, or making them more, um, more uh, what do you call it? Uh, means tested, meaning we're gonna to check to see how much money you have in your bank and right, and we're gonna, and how much money you earn. And then we're gonna adjust more uh, based on that. Um, but most politicians won't touch that. And yet the, as the population ages, that mandatory spending, because it's mostly social programs will continue to grow, right? And it puts pressure on discretionary spending. Um, and so uh, I've heard, 
I've heard our federal government referred to as an insurance company with a, with that that employs an army, right, or an armed insurance company, basically. And so, you know, if you think about it, right, like if you add defense to um, to the social spending, that's pretty accurate. Another piece that's kind of scary, it's not that big yet, but it's going to get a lot bigger in the very near future, is the wedge at the very top that says um, net interest, that gray wedge, the $345 billion. Remember, we're... With a debt this big, right, you have to pay interest on it. It's going to be 300, it's, it was 345 million in 2020 when the interest rates were close to 2%, right? The federal government on its 30 year, on its 30 year bonds was paying someplace, something like 2% interest. Um, and for short bonds, it was paying a fraction of a percent, like a quarter of a percent. Um, now the federal government is moving towards, I think I heard, I just saw the 10 year bond is now at 3%. So the 10 year bond had been trading at like one and a half percent, it's doubled. So that means that this interest we're gonna pay is gonna go up dramatically. So that's another burden that, right? Like interest doesn't get you anything other than you meet your obligations. It doesn't buy new schools, it doesn't buy new roads. So when you have a ton of debt, you have to pay interest and that swallows up your current income. So another kind of a side here is that applies to you all as well, right? The more debt you have in your personal lives, the less you can do because it reduces your freedom because you have to earn money to cover your debt, right? Um, and those debt payments that you're making, if you, especially if you've got, say, you know, I don't know what the normal term is on a on, a, on a, a school loan, but maybe 20 years, something like that. I don't know. The upfront part, the first part of your, your payments are always mostly interest. Um, so the faster you can pay off the de any debts you take out, the better off you will be because a big chunk of it's gonna be interest. So this is how the federal government spends its money. Um, and what's, you know, one of the beautiful things about, the, about living in the United States is, um, you can look it up. And I was going to show you this, but for time, there's a link here, um, and you can see what the federal the 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 2021 graphics were not as good, um, but you can see how the spending was done if you're interested. So what's this going to do? Well, my point here is, as we continue to um, as the population ages and more demand for government spending, and you all and you all are a smaller population relative to the boomers who are gonna be retiring and asking you to pay for their healthcare and their social security, a larger and larger percentage of your paychecks are gonna to have to go to pay for that, right? Um, and so we're gonna have, we're gonna hit a crisis at some point. Um, and it's a very, um, unless, something, uh, unless something else happens, it's likely at some point we're gonna have a problem with making those payments. Because like I said, not that long ago, that social, social spending portion of that wheel that I was showing you was a much smaller fraction. And it's just gonna get bigger with the demographic shift. So politicians tend not to think in long-term. That's why they, none of them want to address this. What they'd rather do is kick it down the road and say, oh, you know, we're never gonna cut Medicare. Okay. you know. Um, we're never going to cut social security. Okay. Well, you know, the demographics have been in place for dec literally for decades. I've first kind of understood this when I was about your age and I was like, holy cow, I, you know what I'd rather do? I'd rather you not, I'd rather not pay into social security. I'd rather just keep the money, invest it myself. Um, and you can keep the social security benefit and just stop taxing me, you know, for social security, but that's not the way it works. If you were to invest, um, if you were to look at social security as an investment, the average return on social security, um, uh, if you were to take, instead of paying your social security taxes so that someday you could get social security, the average benefits wind up resulting in about a 3% return on your investment. So if you, over the lifetime, you pay 7%, 7.5% right now of your earnings in, uh, for social security, and then your employer matches it. So it's like really 14% of your earnings is going into social security. You're gonna be earning 
if you live long enough to collect the social security, you'll have earned about a 3% return on that, on that as an investment. If you invest that money in the stock market, even just a, a basic um, index fund, and I'd be happy to talk to you about these things. If you, you know, if you take finance with me, we'll talk about it a lot. Um, uh, but if you were to invest that money in, in an index fund, a basic index fund, um, which requires no thinking on your part, you could expect about 10% return on investment. So social security um, as an investment sucks, right? Um, uh, and so, but anyway, politicians, you know, like to give out free money um, and they have very few incentive. Who, whichever politician ultimately has to cut social security is gonna get their hand, head handed to them, right? They're gonna lose they'll get voted out of office. So politicians don't like to get voted out of office. So they don't want to address this problem, even though they've known since before I was your age that this was coming, right? It's not been a secret how many people were alive in the United States at any point in time. We've known this was coming and we haven't done anything about it. And so the problem we're gonna face is we've made all these promises and we can't make, meet them and people are making, making life decisions, uh, assuming that they are, um, they are there. So the future um, is, is risky when we talk about, you know, and then you have politicians like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren talking about Medicare for all. When, if you look at the numbers that we just talked about, we can, we're barely paying for what we already have, never mind expanding that. Um, and they could say, well, we just, you know, we just need to pay more taxes. But the problem is, you know, when we have a debt ratio like we're ha we already have, we're just setting ourselves up to go into a recession and, and have lower earnings. So it's just, it's a future that I, I'm concerned for you guys and for my own kids, um, because I think we've made a lot of bad decisions and the incentives politicians face is not to do anything about it. Um, so what are we seeing? Well, we're gonna to continue to see healthcare increase in costs. And I think we're gonna see a, a continued bifurcation in the, in the market. This is me projecting. I think we're gonna see a bifurcation in the market. We're gonna see more HMO type things, very narrow, um, very narrow uh, contracts where you're gonna have very little choice and you're gonna to have to do a lot of mother may I in order to get services. And then we're gonna see uh, the, on the flip side, kind of the far uh, alternative will be a lot of high deductible uh, health plans, right? Um, where you have very high deductible, your, 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 your premiums are relatively low, but you're going to have to pay a lot of money before the insurance company starts to contribute anything. Um, you know, I, and I think this is probably good. I think this is actually probably good. It will start to fix some of the problems. I talked to my colleagues in the health on, on the delivery side all the time. And they're like, we don't like these health, these high deductible health plans because patients don't want to get health care. Well, patients don't want to get health care because if you've got a $10,000 deductible and, an, and, a, and, and a, a provider says, hey, you should go get a $2,000 MRI, right? The patient starts to say, do I really need a $2,000 MRI? Because it's a lot of money. I don't really want to spend that, right? On, you know, uh, uh, and so they get, so doctors are starting to feel the pushback from patients with these high deductible health plans. Doctors have gotten used to everybody having, you know, not everybody, but most people having insurance. And when a doctor says, hey, I want you to go get this test, you're like, okay, whatever, I, you know, I'm gonna pay $25 copay, right? Um, so, and HMOs, as we've discussed, are much more aggressive about managing those services as well. So if you're a doctor working for an HMO, the HMO is gonna be like, are you sure they need that MRI, right? So it's kind of both sides are gonna be pinching on the delivery system saying, you know, on the one hand, the HMOs are gonna be, the insurance companies that run the HMOs are gonna be, are you sure you really need that MRI? And on the consumer side, the high deductible health plans, which are called, often called consumer driven health plans because the consumers have a lot more skin in the game are, the consumers are gonna be saying, do, doc, do I really need to get that thing done? Cause it's really expensive. So those two things, I think we'll see um, uh, some pushback on medical inflation. Uh, so I see, uh, I see a lot fewer PPOs and kind of that middle ground of, of you know, more expensive plans that have um, 
more choice. I see them both that kind of dissolving and going to the two extremes with um, these high deductible health plans where, yeah, you have choice, but you have to pay for most of it. And HMOs where you have very little choice. Um, I, I see con continued consolidation in the health in the health field. I wouldn't, you know, in the five years, as I've talked about in the five, seven, seven years now that I've been here, you know, I've seen, we had almost all of the hospitals in, in New Hampshire, all 20, you know, 26 of them, plus a couple of specialty organizations, you know, were independent. Now, almost all of them are in a system. I mean, there's like one or two left that aren't. I see that continuing. And then I see the systems consolidating into even bigger systems so that you're going to wind up I would say in your lifetime, you'll wind up seeing, you know, um, probably 10 or, I mean, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw a number out there in your lifetime. Maybe there'll be like 10 hospital systems in the country, you know, and the, all your hospitals will be part of them. Maybe like HCA and Tenet and um, Mass General Brigham, you know, and they'll be like, you know, you, you'll have just a handful of them, just like we have a handful of car manufacturers. Um, so I see that all continuing to happen. So I, I'd say watch that, you know, I, the, all the pressures are still in place to see continued consolidation. Something we've talked a lot about, healthcare, right? Seeing a doctor, getting that care, doctors are expensive, right? Going to see a doctor is expensive, getting an MRI is expensive, getting surgery is expensive. Healthcare is expensive. It uses incredible, beautiful technology that is just miraculous, right? We have doctors with a decade plus of experience to take care of us and uh, uh, training to take care of us. The stuff that our health system can do now is literally nothing short of a miracle relative to human history. But it's so expensive, right? It is so expensive. And so healthcare is expensive. Health, on the other hand, is relatively cheap, right? We can, you can, you can expect to live in the United States. You're a woman. We looked at the, the, the charts. Like you as 20-ish old people can expect to live to be about 80, right? Um, and if you take care of yourself, much longer than that, right? So all you nutrition people that eat nothing but kale, right? You're going to live forever uh, unless you get run over by a bus. And then, you know, all bets are off. Uh, but if, you know, but if, you, if you take good care of yourself, and it's relatively inexpensive to take good care of yourself, right? It's relatively expensive to, to, to eat a decent um, diet. It's relatively inexpensive to get a reasonable amount of exercise for the vast majority of the population. And I'm not saying, yes, there's like a 5% of people who are tragically poor and have a lot of problems, but the vast majority, 95% of the US population have the ability to eat better than they do get more exercise than they do, structure their life so that they can get more sleep. And those things are cheap to do. They're a lot cheaper than getting surgery or, you know, going on cholesterol busters. There's a lot less, you know, or, or, or um, blood pressure medication, right? Meditating for 15 minutes a day, which I don't do. Um, but if I did, it would be good. Um, but I do exercise almost every day, right? And exercise is like the best medicine you can take. Um, along with eating a decent diet, which I'm okay at. Um, though I do like cake and beer. Um, and neither one of those things is good for you, right? But it's cheap, right? Like don't drink beer, okay? That doesn't cost anything, um, right? So, so making choices, right, is uh, healthy choices is cheap. So we've talked about that more, hundred, more than 100 minutes idea, right? Your typical person is going to have about 100 minutes encounter with, a, with the health system. The health system can't do that much for you. You have to take responsibility for it, right? Your behaviors and your choices have more to do with your long-term health outcomes than, um, than any of the healthcare does. One of the things that we're seeing as we progress you know, through the 2000s is this idea of patient activation. I've talked to you about my dad being a doctor going through medical school in the 70s. And he was very much told, you're the doctor, you tell the patient how it is. You tell the patient what they need. That's not what they're teaching today. And he had to learn, you know, kind of relearn that um, uh, in his career. Today, what doctors are being coached, are, are being trained to do is to put the patient at the center rather than, than themselves at the center and say, what is it you want? 
what is it you want to accomplish with your health? And as you say, I want to be healthier, you know, I want to be able to move better. I want to have less joint pain. Um, and the doctor says, well, you know, you might want to consider losing hundred pounds. Um, you know, you might want to consider starting to get some exercise and so on, right? But how do you get people to actually do that? This is the problem, right? Because health is cheap, right? Health care is expensive, health is cheap. The main thing is we want to impact people's health behaviors because if you can get people to eat more kale and less cake, right, they will be healthier. So this idea of patient activation uh, is a relatively new idea. Um, and so we have this kind of simple heuristic here of like, level one is relatively disengaged and overwhelmed. I don't know how to take care of myself. I, you know, if doctor's in charge, I'll do whatever the doctor says. Not really, because chances are anybody like that is gonna go home and eat a quart of Ben and & Jerry's and, and drink a liter of Coke, right? Um, and so they're gonna have, they're gonna be overweight. They're gonna be, they're gonna have diabetes. They're gonna have heart condition so on, right? So we've got very disengaged people who don't see themselves as being able to make decisions and, and impact their own health. Then we start to see kind of progressing to the, to the right, higher levels of patient engagement where, you know, I acknowledge that, yes, I, you know, there is, I could probably do, you know, I could maybe like take a walk each day instead of watching another episode of Friends, um, right, to kind of, I'm, I'm not only can I do it, but I'm actually going to engage with my team, my healthcare team and start thinking and making plans to, I am in charge of my own health, right? And the health system is there to help me. It isn't, to, it isn't there to direct me. It is there to help me because I am my own individual capable, I am a, I am a uh, you know, self-directed adult capable of making decisions. So they're talking a lot about this, like how do we get our patients to think more like level four rather than I'm helpless and can't do anything, right? Going back to that discussion of, you know, do you have an internal locus of control or an external locus of control? Does stuff just happen to you, right? Well, if you believe that just stuff just happens to you, you're level one, right? If you believe that you're in charge of, of your own destiny, you're level four. <clears throat> so we're moving in that direction. Um, this is a survey. I'm going to kind of skip over. You want to look at it, you can. This is an organization called Patients Like Me. It's out of uh, Boston. It was built by a couple of MIT engineers. Um, and this is a really cool, uh, it's a website. It's a really cool website where you can go in um, and you can create an account and share your health information um, with the community. So, so why would you do that? Well, let's say you just found out that you have diabetes um, and you're like, ah, I feel overwhelmed. What am I going to do? Like you're level, you know, maybe you're not level one, but you're like level two. Like you're just kind of, ah, you know, where was it? Like I could be doing more for my healthcare, but I don't know what to do yet. Like I want to start taking charge. Well, this is a really cool site where you can go and you'll be like, hey, I have diabetes. Let me log into the, di you, know, I, you know, here's some information about me. I'm a 52 year old, slightly overweight, uh, you know, guy who, who exercises pretty frequently, but, you know, can't keep his hands off the cake. Uh, and now I have diabetes, right? Um, and you can join a community where people share, you know, their stories and they share advice about, um, you know, well, the, hey, this worked for me. Um, and what we found, what studies have found is communities like this can have an exceptionally positive effect on people's health, right? The, the information that gets shared in these kind of communities, particularly like organizations like patients like me, is actually pretty good. Um, they have some curation um, in patients like me. You can also join like a diabetes discussion group on Facebook. Then you can, might get some, you know, crazies out there telling you to do, all, you know, drink your urine or something like that and just, you know, be a mess. But, but what's been really interesting is there have been studies done on some of these of sites like this where they found that um, the advice being given is of very high quality because, you know, in fact, doctors are not like doing anything secret. They're just, they just happen to have a lot of information. Um, and a lot of knowledge. And so 
you're pretty smart too, or you wouldn't be sitting in this room. Um, and, uh, and you can figure out most of this stuff. You don't have to be an endocrinologist to understand diabetes, right? Um, and so this is a really interesting approach of patient activation where people engaged in this, in sites like this are sharing information and taking care of each other and helping to take care of each other. We're also seeing, we talked a little bit about mRNA vaccines, right? I mean, um, one of the things, uh, one of the moves to today in Boston is a huge, um, is a huge hub for biomedical engineering. You, you BMEDs know that, of course. Um, and what we're working today is to say, you know, there's a lot that can be done to personalize information, make it more precise. So we've got this pharmacogenomics, right? The intersection of pharmacy and genetics. What we're realizing is, you know, Motrin might affect me differently than it affects you. So if we can get an appropriate, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a drug that works better for you, maybe we could do a blood test and we can get a more accurate read of, hey, you should take this kind of drug rather than that kind of drug. Um, and the, the challenge here is to go individualized at scale, right? So if I can, if I can make millions of doses of Motrin and you know, say the 200 milligram Motrin, I make you know, probably millions, billions of doses of Motrin, right, uh, out there. Um, but that's not individualized, that's mass produced for kind of the generic market, as opposed to making something that's specific to, to, to your physiology. Um, and that's the kind of holy grail. And we see mRNA, which I think I'm going to get to in a minute, so I won't talk to that. You know, but mRNA is, is one of the things that we're really working toward. AI and machine learning. We run a, a data science program in, in my department. And you know, if I can feed enough information into, into AI, I can make all these amazing predictions about who in my population is likely to wind up getting diabetes, likely to wind up having heart disease. And we can preemptively move in and say, hey, we're looking at you. You know, and our AI says that um, you are likely to have a condition. Let's take action now before it actually happens to you. Transhumanism, I've asked you to watch a video about, right, what was this one? That was the video, was it the Hugh Hare video? Yeah, okay. Um, you know, he talks about, about you know, um, what he can do. There's a whole movement called transhumanism out there where people are talking about like becoming cyborgs and they're really excited about it, you know, uh, figuring out ways to enhance, um, enhance their performance. Um, Elon Musk is working on a project. Let me see, what was it called? Uh, Neuralink. Have you guys heard, any of you heard about this? No. So he's got a, he's working on a, he's got a, a working prototype, uh, uh, where they've got a, um, they've got a implant in a monkey's brain, and the monkey can like I think initially like the monkey had to like work a joystick to get a treat you know to come down or something like that, and then they took away the joystick and now all the monkey has to do is think about the joystick and he gets a treat, and it works like it works in a very primitive level but we're getting to a place where if you're a paraplegic and can't walk, we'll be able to, you know, outfit you with an exoskeleton and a neural link, and you'll be able to, you know, walk without having to, like, you know, control the, the, the mechanisms. Um, I've seen something along the lines of, you know, uh, a person who is a quadriplegic being able to feed themselves using this neural link idea of just thinking about moving the spoon to their mouth. And imagine the restorative benefit of that. Like if you were no longer able to, to feed yourself and suddenly, you know, imagine having to wait for somebody to feed you. What a horrible, you know, what a horrible fate. And so to have something like this happen. And I think in your lifetime, you will see that it's very exciting. Like there's a lot, there's a lot of crappy stuff going on in healthcare, but there's so much amazing things too. It's so exciting. And no one psychedelics, you know, magic mushrooms, all that stuff, LSD, as it's turning out, psychedelics um, can be used clinically 
to alleviate chronic anxiety and depression. There's a 60s LSD got a really bad name. Psychedelics got a really bad name. They got um, people were abusing them, of course, because that's what they did in the 60s and 70s. Um, uh, uh, and a lot of people got hurt in the process. But what we're discovering now is if you have somebody with chronic depression or chronic anxiety, you can give them a um, you can give them uh, psychedelics uh, uh, and coupled with therapy, right? Not just like, hey, you're depressed. Let me give you some LSD, right? That's not going to necessarily work. Um, uh, and it could actually be harmful, but coupled with psych with psychotherapy and appropriate environment, we're finding that it's possible that these, that psychedelics can actually kind of reset the brain for some of these chronic mental illnesses and can actually, you know, dramatically improve people's lives. The problem is we have a cultural, you know, a negative cultural association uh, coming out of the, the 60s and 70s and drug culture and, you know, and, and LSD is nothing but hippies and, you know, dirty, smelly hippies. Um, and so we've got these legal restrictions. So people who want to do research on these sorts of treatments are, are having to run up against the fact that this is a, you know, a highly illegal substance, right? And, but that's changing. So that's exciting too. Um, we see things like transgender um, this is, this is a snap from Mass Eye and Ear, so down in Boston. They offer um, gender-affirming uh, treatment, such as facial uh, plastic surgery um, for either feminization or masculinization of a face, right? Because if you start, we've talked about this, if you start cross-gender hormones early enough, your body will actually look like the other sex. Right? It will actually grow to look like the other sex. Um, but if you don't, if you wait till you're adult and you've gone through the puberty of your birth sex, then you are, it's going to take a lot of effort for you to look like the other sex. So if you're a biological male and you go through male puberty, you're going to have a larger shoulder, narrower hips, right? Relatively speaking, you're going to have an Adam's apple. You're going to have a deeper voice. Um, and if you decide, you know, this wasn't the, this is not the gender that I want to live, um, you know, you'll have facial hair, all that kind of stuff. So there, you know, we are developing um, uh, surgery, surgical interventions that can help people who uh, decide they are transgender later in their lives. I, I personally think this is probably the most exciting thing that has happened, you know, mRNA technology. I am so excited about this, uh, you know, uh, whenever I think about it the mRNA vaccines uh, were, are just the tippity tip of the iceberg of potential here. Uh, and you guys who are more in the science side of things will understand this better than I do, right? But mRNA is basically like you've got DNA, right? And you've got mRNA, uh, mRNA is, uh, uh, um, is like a messenger, right? It goes out and tells cells what to do. <clears throat> so the mRNA vaccines that we got basically said, hey, you know, Hey, uh, uh, cells, go be prepared to fight, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, viruses that look like this. Um, uh, that's just the, like the simplest application. There are so many other things that, you know, when we talk about personalized medicine, if you talk to an oncologist, they will tell you, Cancers, you know, every, uh, they will tell you every cancer is unique. Every cancer is unique because every cancer is the result of an error in cellular repl replication, right? And so it's, n so no two errors are the same. And so every, so you might have lung cancer and somebody else might have lung cancer. Those are the result of two different replication problems. They may have similar, I mean, if they're in the same tissue, right? They may have similar characteristics. And so we can blast them with a chemotherapy that's been proven to work on, on cancer that's like that. But what mRNA presents us with the possibility of is that personalized medicine that I was just talking about a minute ago, where we can take a, a biopsy of your cancer. And then we can, you know, and then we can program the mRNA, an mRNA uh, uh, treatment that will then, you know, give you a shot 
that then will tell your white blood cells, hey, there's some cancer cells floating around. They look like this. Seen this? You see a guy who looks like this? Kill him, right? And, and all of a sudden, you know, you could potentially have your body producing its own cure, right? Where the white, where the white blood cells are going out and, and hunting down your cancer and killing it. That's like, that's, a, that's like a real part. That, that's where the mRNA is going. That is so exciting. In your lifetime, we could see a cure for cancer, right? Because every cancer is, is unique. And so we need something like an mRNA vaccine that programs the white blood cells to go hunt cancer. And not just any cancer, but your cancer. It can also, so I have a, a, a relative, uh, a relative of mine who has muscular, muscular dystrophy, right? Which is an autoimmune, autoimmune disease where the, where the immune system attacks your nervous system. And so she has progressively been losing her ability to control her movements, right? She's fully, she's, she's very, very, you know, intelligent person, but she is now basically confined to a wheelchair and she's not that much older than me, right? Horrible, horrible, debilitating disease that affects many people that usually hits you in your twenties. Um, and this is one of those things where we just need a mechanism to tell the auto, to tell the immune system, knock it off. That's not the bad guy. You're attacking the wrong thing, right? But that's what's happening is your own body is attacking yourself. Alopecia, uh, you know, the slap that was heard around the world that you guys saw on the right. Uh, what's uh, Jane? What's her name? The, the Dana, whatever Jada Smith, right? So Will, uh, am I getting wrong? Am I, what am I? Will Smith, right? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say the story and I'm blanking on all the names, right? So Will Smith slapped uh, Chris Rock uh, because he made fun of Jada Smith, his Smith's wife who has alopecia. Alopecia is one of those situations where is where you lose your hair. That's your autoimmune system. Your immune system is for whatever reason attacking your hair. Like, could you leave that alone? You know, I mean, I'd rather have it attack my hair than my ner nerve system. But it's the same thing. Like, hip, little, you know, potentially little auto, you know, shot of mRNA, and and tells the the immune system knock it off. Like these are things that are coming. The amazing things that are coming, uh, potentially in your lifetime. All right, so last slide um, as we roll into the last minutes here. So I talked to you at the beginning of the semester about we, you know, the, the theme of this class is the US healthcare system. And I said, what does that mean to you? What is a system, right? And you can think of, of, of a mechanical system or you can think of an organic system. <clears throat> if you believe that the world, the social world, right, which is very much, US healthcare system is, is a social phenomenon. If you believe that the social world can be manipulated and controlled the way that a watch can be manipulated and controlled, then, um, you know, then you can potentially, you have one way of looking at the world. You can go in and you can make tweaks and um, maybe you can fix, fix the system. An alternative way of thinking about the about the social world is like a school of fish, right? And the fish have their own opinions about stuff. And if you make one change over here, you're likely to get other responses that you did not expect. So if nothing else from this, I'd like you to think about, you know, I've tried to present to you not just healthcare, but a lens about thinking about a lot of social phenomenon, right? Um, healthcare is complicated. It's not just complicated, it's complex. There are many interacting parts. And I would say that the model that I'd like you to come away thinking about the US healthcare system is, it's more like a school of fish than it is like a watch. All right, so good luck on the exam. Nice, nice, uh, nice to meet you all. Best wishes, hopefully I'll see some of you uh, in the near future. All right, take care. Thank you.